This is the new legislation. <laughs> this is the uh, Children and Families Act. And then what the government decided to do was to get a really simple, clear, easy and accessible way of, of understanding all of that. So they put some regulations in, which was fine, they were only about that big. And then the Code of Practice. So the Code of Practice is basically all of that. Nice and clear and easy to understand. And of course all the teachers and all the local authority case workers will all have read that and digested that and really understood it because it's a simple and easy document to understand. Um, there are various other small regulations and there's also importantly a transitions document. And it is right to say that within the new legislation there are principles and essentially those principles say children and young people need to be involved in um, what happens to them, they need to be involved in the decisions, they need to be involved in all aspects of um, what happens to them and things ought to be done in the best interests of the child. Now you would have thought that you didn't need a law actually, uh, that, that might have been obvious but apparently not and that is now part of the new law. So there's principles. Um, there is information, advice and support, so uh, an obligation placed on all local authorities is to ensure that there is information, advice and support within the locality available um, to parents and importantly to young people as well. Um, the next thing is that for children with special needs, um, children that used to be on School Action or School Action Plus, which does apply to quite a lot actually of children with ADHD but who aren't statemented, they move from that to um, just something called SEND Support, which is a new system which I'll talk to you about. Um, and then children that were on statements now move to Education, Health and care plans. One of the other changes is that personal budgets is a new thing um, which facilitates direct payments which I'll talk to you about a little bit more but not too much because at the moment it's not something that most people are accessing. A personal um, budget is just the local authority setting out how much money different provision that your children um, use and have as part of their statements, how much money and where it's spent on on what, um, which you can request. Direct payments are not personal budgets. Direct payments is when you actually physically receive the money um, to um, commission a service yourself. So as an example, instead of using whatever the local authority provides, you might, for example, instruct your own speech and language therapist, for example, using direct payments. Um, the other big change is the age groups. So before special needs ended at the end of normal childhood um, in legal terms um, at 18, now it's going up to 25. Um, it's, that's interesting and important and theoretically really helpful because people got to an age and then just sort of fell off a cliff and lost all their support. At the moment, AFC is working to develop the 16 to sort of 18, 19 services within the borough, but they're talking just really about bridging the gap between, um, you know, ch children with special needs and statements and stuff and adult services. So they're not working on a new provision for children that are 18 to 25, but under the new system, um, people are entitled to have their education, health and care plans go up to 25 as long as they're not in higher education, so they're not at university um, and they, they stay in education. Education, yes, so if they're still at a further education college and they still need the support then they're entitled not only to have the continuation of their education, health and care plan but also to apply for one if, they are, if they've left school. The other thing is that there's dis disagreement resolution um, services and there is mediation. Um, now me the mediation service that has been commissioned by this borough, so there are mediators out there um, and what you need to know about that is when you disagree, which may happen from time to time with the local authority about decisions they're making, then in a number of circumstances you are now obliged to consider, that doesn't mean do, just consider mediation, okay? As long as you ring up, and I, I've done it because I was in a pilot thing when I was taking the local authority here to tribunal very recently, um, if you ring up and say, I just want you to know that I've considered using your mediation services, they have to issue you with a certificate. So you don't have to do it. It may be that you want to avoid the stress of going to tribunal. It may be that you feel 
it would be really worthwhile um, to sit down with the local authority and that they're bound to change their minds and be more reasonable and you'll be able to compromise. And if you feel like that, then clearly mediation is a, is a less stressful route. Um, it, you know, that we, we need to wait and see what happens, how many people use it and, and whether it it's of any benefit. In family law, mediation is really, really successful, but I think that that's a very different arena, um, and I think that um, the usual sort of conflicts that, that we as parents have with the local authority are often to do with money and costs, and I don't think that their budget's going to get any bigger because they mediate, and I also, one of the, the important things I should say, um, which underlies some of my cynicism about the reforms, is that we are in times of austerity, and there has been money pumped into the system for implementing the reforms there is no new money in the system for any of the services so it's not the case that there's loads more money to do any of the things that you'll hear about um, it's only to make the system look good so really really they have AFC sorry it's achieving for children so oh, it's so it's the it's the local authority reinvented as a as a company yeah. um, offering all, all the children's services so so those are essentially the overviews um, so coming on to the, the substance of it then there's um, there are general duties that um, all the the local authority what we know as AFC here the local authority health um, health uh, commissioners um, social care so that's the social services part of the local authority and schools all have to now cooperate with each other and communicate with each other and work together so uh, for those people who've had the experience that CAMS here for example don't talk to schools and, and vice versa or the local authority well that's apparently all going to now change because they're all obliged under the new law to talk to each other Children with special educational needs, and this has not changed, but it's in the, in the new law, um, must be educated in a mainstream environment subject to certain exceptions, and one of those exceptions is parental wishes, and other ones are to do with efficient education of other children. So if they're considered to be um, affecting so adversely the, the other children and no reasonable adjustments could be made, then they can... Um, be sent against parental wishes to a specialist setting but essentially it reiterates that a mainstream school the idea is inclusion that children with special needs should be in mainstream school um, something new is that children can now be admitted to a, a special school um, without an education health and care plan so without a statement a child can now be admitted to a special school um, they are as soon as they arrive there is supposed to be immediately triggered an assessment for an education health and care plan good and bad probably if you're a parent who desperately wants your child in a specialist setting great bad because no one's done an assessment to check that that is the right place before the child gets there. So that is something new and I don't know how that will pan out, we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. One of the things that you can use that's an important principle of the new law is that schools must use and other educational, I, I talk about schools but this applies to further education colleges and also early years, schools and early years provisions and further education college must now use their best endeavours to secure special educational provision if your child has special needs and needs that provision irrespective of whether they've got a statement or not so if your child in theory needs occupational therapy then school and other institutions have to use their best endeavours to get that provision in place for your child. I don't know how they're going to pay for it but that is the um, that is the new principle um, and requirement. Yeah. Mm. Does your child have to have a, 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 a diagnosis? No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's no requirement for any child to have a diagnosis in order to be um, assessed and recognised as having special educational needs. Um, Anyway, so the other things are, um, there's a requirement for uh, SENCOs, which has always been there, to be properly qualified, um, and that basically means that they are either the head teacher or a qualified teacher, and then, and I've forgotten the year, I think it's 2006 or 2009, but I can't remember, um, anyone new to becoming a SENCO at that stage has to do a, like an accreditation process, which I think is really, really useful because I think that the demands on SENCOs are huge and increasingly huge, um, and so some help in training would be is really important and the, the final other main general thing is that a um, 
uh, that e all schools have to have a um, send report on their website so they have to have a report detailing what is available in their school for children with special needs how they're not discriminating against children how they are actively ensuring that children aren't treated um, unfavorably um, and their approach to um, SEN and, and disability. Is that new, that's a new requirement, do you say? Yeah, that's, a, that's right. a new requirement, and that is... So basically a website has to... What it will look like on most schools' websites is a policy that says, you know, we include everyone, you know, we welcome people of all different, you know, shapes and sizes, all of that. But it should detail, for example, we within this school we provide. doesn't mean that you can get it, mind you, but we provide special speech and language therapy. We have... Do small group work on social communication or whatever whatever they're providing and also how we ensure that we're we're inclusive um, so um, as I said although this is a new law and people are worried and, and frightened about it a lot of things have actually stayed exactly the same so the legal definition of um, when a child has special needs is exactly the same under the old law and the new law the um, the threshold as to when you need to carry out uh, an assessment for uh, a, an education health care plan, which used to be called a statement, the test is exactly the same. The threshold that has to be met in order for a statement to be made or an education health care plan under the new system to be made is exactly the same. So it's not the case that anyone who has a statement now or anyone who is on school action or school action plus now, um, no, nothing should change for those children. If they if their needs haven't changed, then nothing should change in terms of their provision. So other crucial things to know: there is now this term young person. A young person is anybody aged 16 and over. Um, young people are now hugely important much to my despair because <laughs> because a, if, a, if a child is 16 and still in education and has an education health care plan uh, or, or just has special needs their views now prevail so if you as the parent disagree with your child your 17 year old child because we all know how sensible 17 year olds are um, their view now prevails so if they decide well actually you might think I want to go and do retakes of GCSEs but what I actually want to go and do is something completely different like a, a football coaching course because actually that would be really fun and I love football um, then that's what happens because their view prevails so the professionals all have to act in everyone's best interest but their view prevails subject to it being in their best interest and any other of the exceptions that apply very very important for children who may fall into this group because children with ADHD can be perfectly bright they are perfectly capable of expressing themselves we all know that much um, and so they're going to be really able to articulate themselves. They're not children that are non-verbal with very complex needs. The only way you're going to be able to, your views are going to be able to prevail when your child doesn't agree with you, or your young person doesn't agree with you, is when they lack mental capacity and you have to go to court about that and they need to be their mental capacity needs to be assessed and also mental capacity is on a decision by decision basis so important to know about when they talk about young people that's important and within the borough now although it's not up and running yet young people will have their own advocates and they will have their own access to advice which is completely separate from that advice that's going to be available to um, to parents um, other hugely important thing for anyone who's got a statement now um, for their child is that they stay you remain under the old law so if you've got a statement now you you are still under the old law none of the new law applies to you um, and your statement is valid in exactly the same way as it was before if you want to um, challenge or change anything about it you do that under the old law if you want your statement has to be annually reviewed in the same way as before um, and the same things apply until you go through transition so the only way to get an education health care plan is to go through an education health and care needs assessment um, and that is a particular process which I won't go into in huge amounts of detail but essentially it involves a meeting together of all the relevant professionals, a caseworker from the local authority and they've been lacking and missing and all sorts of things from previous reviews um, but uh, all the professionals and the parent and uh, unless it's inappropriate the young person have all got to be part of a meeting 
Um, advice needs to be sought in order for an education healthcare plan um, assessment to happen, and there's a range of professionals that it needs to be uh, that need to be consulted. For transition purposes, if all the reports and things from educational psychologists and stuff are all up to date and the parent consents, and this is a really important thing, the parent must consent, so must everybody else, then you can use old advice to transfer into the new education healthcare plans. However, if everybody doesn't consent, then you have to seek new advice from that range of professionals. So that will be, you know, uh, not only the people that are ordinarily there, like educational psychologists, social services for the social care aspect of things, a medical um, doctor, but also anyone else that you reasonably request. So if you reasonably request an expert's report and it's reasonable, then the local authority have to get that advice, which is hugely important. And I don't think they realise how important that is because they're expensive to get your own reports and most people can't afford them. So a um, draft document from Richmond. And in that it has the um, proposed timetable. So for anyone who's statemented, they have to look at the bottom here and see which school year their child's in. Sorry, so if you look there... And so, for example, if I, my son is in year, my um, son with a statement is in year seven now, so I can look and find year seven and see that the transfer date will be 1st of September 2016 to 31st of August 2017, and he's in phase number three. And so that's the plan. And so if, if you look at the year group your child's in, you can see when they should transfer over. Um, and, you know, I know that Universal Credits have worked really well with this ambitious transferring over. And I, you know, I already am hearing that local authorities in different parts of, of, um, of London certainly are saying we think we've been a bit ambitious. We didn't realise there was so much involved in a transfer review. We didn't realise we were going to have to attend meetings. Oh, wow. um, and so maybe we're not going to be able to do all this in time because, of course, this is, this is children that are, have existing statements. So in this borough, uh, in Richmond, it's about 900 um, children that have got statements. I think it's a similar amount in Kingston. Um, that's quite a lot of people to go through with no new staff and no new resources um, to do transitions as well as new assessments and issues that are arising for children already. Can I just ask a quick question about the yeah. meeting? Are parents allowed to take in representation to those? Yes, yes you can take representation to wherever you, um, wherever you like, any meetings with the local mm. authority. And, right. But there's also funding that was provided from central government, and this is where IS comes in. I just think it's brilliant. So now you can go to IS if if you want some uh, support um, because IS is now just to confuse everybody is independent supporters and it's taken me ages of going to meetings with people to understand the difference so independent advice and support is parent partnership Right. So they have always been there to advise and support anyone who has an issue with special educational needs and their, their child, whether that's an issue you have in school, whether that's trying to get a statement or uh, now an education health care plan, whatever, they've always been there to help you. Uh, there is also independent supporters who are uh, central government funded. There is someone called Jonathan Rourke who has a team of five people working over a, no, yeah, he used to work in early years, do you know him? Wow. Yeah. So he is working with uh, four other people who've got various sort of full time and part time contracts to deliver a service, and it's, I think, Hounslow, he's working in Wandsworth as well, Hounslow, Richmond, and Kingston. Um, and their very specific role is to help anyone who's applying for a new uh, plan, so if they're applying for an education, health and care plan, or if they're involved in transition. They can't help with any of the other stuff, but they what can the serv How the service is operating in Richmond and Kingston is that everybody's contacting indep uh, independent supporters, there is one telephone number or email address, and they are then deciding whether they're helping you or whether you should be referred on to what was parent partnership, which is now independent advice and support. So those are the main areas of, of local support. I strongly recommend that anyone who hasn't looks at IPSE's website, which is IPSEA, because, and, and there's, there, there's this one of the, the briefings in there, because they the information on the website alone is absolutely fantastic. There are model letters, there is a step-by-step -step guide through everything, and they also provide uh, an advice line. It's difficult to get through because it's all manned by volunteers. An advice line and also... 
um, tribunal representation if you in selected cases I should say if you have to go that far but what's important about them is that there's no association whatsoever with the local authority they are fighters and you know they, they really are, are very very good so but also one of the things that I'm really struggling with as a, as a parent and think everyone else is is how on earth is anyone supposed to know which of these groups you're supposed to go to for what so I'm trying to get a comprehensive document produced one of the reasons why it's not there is because no one actually knows most of the people in those positions are new they're new jobs they've just recently been created they don't know what their own role is so it's very difficult to communicate that to other people but for parents usability purposes um, we're trying to get that that um, to be made clearer but just going back to um, the, the changes. The SEND support, so for anyone who doesn't have a statement of special needs, um, the new system is going to be, um, it's called the graduated approach, it's known as SEND support, the graduated approach, and what you do, so especially for people in early years as well, this applies, um, is assess, plan, do, review. So nice and catchy. So all children on entry to your establishment should be assessed to see whether they have special educational needs. I don't know who's doing that and how, but they should be assessed. Um, things to look at are going to be, are they making reasonable progress in line with their peers who start at the same base level? Are they able to access the various resources within the school, that kind of thing? Um, and obviously some children will come with pre-existing diagnoses and stuff. So it's assess, then plan so that you make a plan about what you're going to try to achieve, what support you're going to put in place, you know, list some outcomes that you're going to try and achieve, say, for example, that term. So it's similar, something similar, probably, to an IEP, an in, in, in individual education plan. Um, so this is replacing? The this is, re yeah. So this is uh, replacing school action, school action plus, so for children who don't have a statement or, or a plan. Um, then you do... So then you do whatever it is, you use your best endeavours to provide that special educational need support that that child requires. So you run your small social communication groups, you provide speech and language therapy or, or whatever it is you do, and then you review to see how you're doing. So, uh, so that's the process, and so that you're aware, the new law is in force, but schools and, and other institutions have a year, so they've got to August 2015 to implement this new system. And within this new system, um, there are going to be um, various requirements placed on schools. So, for example, um, they have to meet with parents three times a year. So you're entitled to have a meeting three times a year. Um, they have to keep records of all this. They, they, the school. Senko. So it's effectively going to be the Senko. So they have to assess, plan, do and review. The, te the class teacher retains responsibility for all of this. So whilst they may delegate, delegate certain aspects to a teaching assistant, they are primarily responsible for ensuring that this all, this all happens. So school has until August 2015 to, to change over, to transition to the system. Your school's not getting an extra Senko, your school's not getting extra class teachers, but they will be expected on top of everything they're doing already to now be doing assess, plan, do and review. From a parent's point of view, that's good because you're entitled to a, an annual report every year, which you would get anyway, but you're also entitled to three meetings a year where you're able to say, can I see because schools have to share this with parents. Can I see the, um, you know, the plan? Can I see what you've been doing? Can we review what you've been doing? Um, uh, so you're entitled to see all of that. So the other thing is, if your child has special needs, which you've probably all guessed by now, if your child has ADHD um, of some kind or another, um, then you have to be informed. So there is an obligation. I mean, a lot of children are on School Action Plus and their parents have no idea because no one actually told them. So they don't actually know. The other thing I should say importantly is that before, the distinction between School Action and School Action Plus was School Action Plus is when things are getting a bit tricky and you're starting to invite external professionals in for some advice and some help. At any stage now during um, this new process, uh, external professionals can be brought in. Again, I don't know who's going to pay, but they, and because each school has a very small amount of hours usually of uh, EP, educational psychologist help. But um, I should say, sorry, just because I know there's at least one person in the room with, with an LDA, if you want to transition to an education, health and care plan, the obligation is on you 
that's the distinction from everybody else it's on you to apply for, for, for an education health and care plan and so this is the body of the document so this is the kind of main document uh, it will look different in different local authorities so whilst this is Richmond and Kingston's template there is no, um, there is no uh, requirement on any local authorities to do it in a particular way as long as it's got the key ingredients. So part A essentially is your child's and your parents and those two things should be distinguished. Their views, their interests and their aspirations. It's lovely, it's very nice, it has no legal effect whatsoever and so you should not think that if part A um, is written in a way you don't like, you can go to tribunal about it. You can't. It's not legally enforceable. But my understanding is local authorities have no real interest in Part A, and so what they're saying is to independent supporters who are doing advising the new people that are applying now is you go away and write that. So generally, the parent, if they're able, will be asked to write Part A with the child and maybe with some independent support. Local authorities are not interested in writing about what your child likes to eat um, for breakfast unless it's a special need that your child has to do with eating. You know, they're, they're otherwise Part A is all about an introduction to your child. Part B is special educational needs. This is what was part two in the old statement. So the bit that says this is what you struggle with and this is what your difficulties are and you know what you need help with um, accessing. This is an important part because it's a legally enforceable part that you can take to tribunal. You want every single need that your child has to be listed in there in order for the provision that's later on in the plan to be um, written to match what your child's needs are. So it's really important that every need is in there. Uh, part C is healthcare needs. Um, it's a little bit disappointing for most people that what they thought was going to happen is that they're going to have this great document which is this, has the same power as a statement, is going to have education, health, and care in it because what people assumed is that they were going to be able to wave this document around and demand things. Um, health care needs cannot be challenged at tribunal. Um, health care needs uh, are, and it, you know, are written in there to give a description. If you don't like what is said about your child's health care needs or what's in that part C, then your way of challenging that is going through the complaints process of your healthcare provider, so it doesn't have the same force um, as the parts relating to special educational needs. Um, part D is social care needs. Now I didn't really, uh, as a parent, understand what that meant. I thought that meant, oh, because your child is under social services, they've been, they're a child in need in the sense of, you know, you're abusing them or, you know, for whatever reason they're neglected or whatever, something to do with that. Now if there are those issues, they can be referred to because it's helpful information often but it's talking about social care um, under what I think in Richmond is provided by the children's disability team and it's things like if you need adaptions to your home if you need respite care short breaks things like that um, those things go in there and again it's not legally enforceable through tribunal it is you have to go to the local authorities in uh, internal complaints process if you want to challenge any decisions about that. Um, part E is outcomes. Now outcomes have replaced objectives. So objectives in your in the, your statements are now outcomes. And outcomes are supposed to be smart, I always forget what that means, but anyone who works in education will know. Um, specific, measurable, um, attainable, realistic, realistic and, timely. and timely. So for example, they an outcome is not I want to be a rocket scientist when I'm five, it's you know by the end of this term or this academic year I want to be able to you know count to 20 or whatever you are supposed to be able to do when you're five um, or you know I would really like to be able to for someone with social communication issues I'm really able to keep some friends you know or to be able to play my friends or you know whatever it is um, so those are outcomes outcomes are not um, chat legally enforceable so you can have whatever you want written in there but you can't enforce it legally however if what you don't you know if what you want written in there is not being written in there then you can use this night section 19d remember about best possible educational outcomes and talk about that when you're talking with the local authority and lawyers think it might be possible to judicially review 
that part of a plan and that's if the local authority might be acting unreasonably about any decision you can judicially review them and I'm not going to bore you with the details of that. So that makes, is it partly what the, maybe what the child would want for themselves yes. and the parents and the Yeah, so it's everybody, everybody should be feeding in to inform these outcomes. So, so that, that's the idea of the round table meeting as part of the assessment process is that everybody's contributing and, and it's all in the interest of the child but that the child's views are in there. So it may be that everyone doesn't agree with the outcomes that the child wants but they, they should still be reflected. So, but, but, it, but you'll see that any bit where it's all about the child's views is not legally informed. Um, so, you know, there you go. Um, part F is the special educational provision. So here's the where you normally have your argument about how many hours support your child has, whether they need um, ABA, whether they need speech and language, you know, whether they need support at play times or not, um, and all the other needs that they, the, 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 the provision to meet all the needs that they have. So the provision should exactly match the need. So if you've got 20 needs detailed up in part B, you should have 20 bits of provision. And that's the same as statements, by the way, um, in your um, provision. That is important. That's legally enforceable. That's the bit that you can take to tribunal if you're not happy um, with the contents. Part G is healthcare provision. Great, says all of us who have to come and get our scripts like we're on methadone for our children that are on Ritalin. Um, great that it's there. Um, great that the idea is that our psychiatrists and other healthcare um, providers are supposed to be at our meetings. I don't know how many people have had the psychiatrists at their meetings before, but it's quite tricky to get everyone around the table at the same time. Um, but the difficult bit of that, or the difficult issue with that, is that you can only have anything written into healthcare in terms of provision for healthcare. If the commissioning authority, so if you know the NHS, your healthcare provider, whoever's providing it, um, consents. So if you have a need for a therapy, for example, my strong advice is that you get it written in as a special educational need because you have that's legally enforceable and no one has to agree to it. If it goes in there, you're entitled to it. If it goes into healthcare and people are misinforming various parents about this if it goes into healthcare you can't legally enforce it you can complain to the NHS or whoever your commissioning body is about part G so uh, you want a knee you want anything that's quasi medical or medical what you need to do is and this is old law is that you need to say why that is a special educational need so if your child cannot communicate using speech properly or I say properly, or if to a standard that's effective for them, um, then you want that to go in as an educational need because without it, they can't access the education system. So all I'm saying is that for anyone who's going through the process of changing a statement or you know going through a transition review or anything, be really wary of what goes into to G unless you've got your psychiatrist or any other healthcare provider so saying, saying we're happy to put it in there. Um, so you come to H. H is social care provision. So remember we talked about social care needs. Um, so social care provision is the provision to match those social care needs. Um, and it's in two parts. It's, health, it's health, uh, social care um, provision and social care needs and exactly the same as education. Okay, and then you have I, and I is usually the thing that there causes lots of arguments. I is placement, so um, it was, it's what was part four in statements, or is part four still in those people that have got statements. It's legally enforceable. So um, that's the bit that you can take to tribunal if, if a school or other placement is named for your child that you don't agree with. J is direct payments and personal budgets. Again, that's not legally enforceable, so um, if you don't like the decision made about what goes into Part J about personal budgets and direct payments um, and uh, your challenge is to ask the local authority to review their decision. So if they say, we're not prepared to give you direct payments because we heard that you were an alcoholic and you spent your money on alcohol, or we're not going to pay direct payments to you for a teaching assistant or learning support assistant because the school don't consent because if you want to pay for your own um, 
you know, person to go in and support your child, the school has to consent because it's in their environment and I imagine schools will rarely consent because of lots of issues that that gives rise to. Um, if you disagree with that bit, you can't challenge it, you can't go to tribunal legally, you can ask the local authority to review their own decision. And that works really well, as everyone will know who've ever asked an institution to review their own decision. Um, and finally, Part K. Uh, part K is the bit that just lists all the advice that's been sought. So it, which, it's just like an appendix type document that you have in a statement now that says, you know, an educational psychologist report dated and anyone else, parents' views um, and anyone else who's contributed. And that, that should be in there. So in short, that is an education, health and care plan and no one really knows exactly how it's going to work. Everything needs to be tried and tested um, for people to have a clear understanding. But just do remember that a lot of things are already, already established principles and, and those key things um, won't change. So no one should be losing their, their statement as part of transition unless as part of that assessment process it's decided that the child no longer meets the need for that provision so that is a possibility that people could lose their provision but not because they're transitioning because their needs have changed yeah.